Hi everyone, welcome to today's broadcast. This webinar is being brought to you by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as SDAP. And our topic today is Upgrading Distribution Resilience, a DOE-OE solicitation. Now before we get started, I'd like to go over some quick housekeeping notes. All of our participants today are in listen-only mode, and this means that you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Um, there's a couple ways that you can join the audio portion of this webinar. You can select mic and speakers to avoid toll charges and uh, use your computer's VoIP capabilities, or you can join us using your telephone. And if you do that, please enter the PIN number that you see on your screen into your telephone keypad. And another important note is that we're asking all of our audience members to please submit your questions as you think of them at any time during today's webinar by typing them into the question box on your webinar console on your screen and hitting send. We'll be reading through the questions throughout the webinar and we will have time for a Q&A after everyone's presentations. So please do submit your questions as you think of them. And a final note is that this webinar is being recorded. You'll find a recording of this webinar as well as all of our previous CESA webinars archived on our website at cesa.org backslash webinars. And with that, I'd like to pass this over to Todd Alinsky paul Todd is the SDAP Project Director, and he is going to be introducing our guest speakers today and talking a bit more about our webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Samantha. I want to welcome everybody to the webinar. This is Todd Alinsky paul I am a Project Director at Clean Energy States Alliance, and this webinar presentation uh, is one of our STEP. Uh, series, which is the State and Federal Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Uh, we have a um, uh, little change of plans today. Unfortunately, um, DOE apparently is suffering from a power outage. Uh, so I'm not sure whether all four of our speakers that we plan to have will be here. We have three on the line, and we're hoping the fourth may join at some point. So I'm going to go ahead and, and go forward with this. Um, one thing that's a little different for most of our webinars regarding questions, uh, because this is a uh, funding opportunity from DOE, uh, the questions on technologies are fine and we'll do our best to, to get those answered. Questions on procurement cannot be answered during this webinar but need to be submitted directly to DOE and we will provide information on how to do that uh, in just a little bit. So uh, I would like to start by thanking Dr. Emery Zhuk of DOE Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability for uh, supporting us and also Dan Borneo from Sandia National Laboratories. Our SDAP program is uh, under contract with Sandia and funded by Dr. Zhuk at DOE. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of background on STAP. STAP is a, is a project of CESA, CESA's nonprofit organization. We work primarily with states and state clean energy funds and agencies. Uh, and you can see here that uh, there's a, a map with some call-outs indicating states where we are currently engaged on energy storage development and deployment through our STAP program. STAP primarily uh, does two things. One is to bring information on energy storage to our stakeholders. This says we have over 500 mem members on our listserv. Actually, we need to update this slide. We have over 1,000 at this point. Also, uh, in addition to webinars and, and uh, information updates, we work to facilitate public-private partnerships at the state level to support energy storage demonstration project development. So what that means is we try to bring states to the table to partner with DOE on getting energy storage projects deployed. Next slide, please. I want to point out a couple things. We are always get questions on these webinars about how people can get hold of the webinar or the slides afterwards. And so if you look at the screen, you'll see on the left there is a red arrow pointing to the link on our website. It says Energy Storage Resources and Webinar Archives. That's where you would go to find this and all our webinars which are archived on our website. If you want to be alerted to uh, 
coming upcoming webinars. Uh, look at the sign up for the listserv button in the red circle. That's what you would click on our website to be able to sign up to get on our listserv and get information about forthcoming webinars. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we, we have them listed here in order of who is speaking first, second, third, etc. So first up we will have Ryan Watson. Uh, he is an engineer in the Energy Delivery Technologies Division of uh, NETL, the National Energy Technology Laboratory of uh, USDOE. He's a project manager in NETL's Office of Energy Project Management, Energy Delivery Technologies Division and uh, supports the DOE's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. Over the past, past five years, he's managed projects focusing on state and local energy assurance and resilience planning, smart grid data access, and creating a legal and regulatory framework for our smart electric grid. Uh, after Ryan, we will have Dan Tan speaking. He is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary of Power Systems Engineering Division within the U.S. DOE Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability. Uh, he's responsible for managing development of projects for next generation electricity delivery technologies and supporting activities to accelerate their introduction to the marketplace. His focus is on smart grid research and development, energy storage, and cybersecurity for energy delivery systems. Following Dan Tan, we will have Dr. Imri Zhuk. Uh, Imri joined the Department of Energy initially to manage the thermal and physical storage program. For the past decade, he has directed the Electrical Energy Storage Research Program in the Office of Electricity, which develops a wide portfolio of storage technologies for a broad spectrum of applications. Uh, he also supervises the $185 million ARRA stimulus funding for grid-scale energy storage demonstrations. And uh, finally, and I, again, I'm not sure whether she'll be able to join us, Dr. Carol Hawk, Program Manager, uh, Cybersecurity for Energy Delivery Systems, and again, in the Office of Electricity Delivery. Uh, she manages the cybersecurity um, for energy delivery systems R&D program and uh, coordinates industry, academic, and national laboratory-led R&D to advance the energy sector's roadmap vision of resilient energy delivery systems designed, installed, operated, and maintained to survive a cyber incident while sustaining critical functions. And again, we hope that she can join us, but we understand <coughs> that uh, her offices uh, have a power outage and we, she may not be able to. Uh, join us. So, uh, next slide, please. So, I think we are ready to begin. Can you advance the slides or go to the first slide for Mr. Watson, please? I'll bring up Brian's slides. Okay, thank you very much. So, I, I'm going to now turn this over to uh, Ryan Watson. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Watson, and I am an engineer with the U.S. Department of Energy's National Energy Technology Lab, or NETL. I will be presenting today on the U.S. DOE's Resilient Electricity Delivery Infrastructure, or READY, initiative, including the purpose of the FOA, the eligibility requirements, and the merit review criteria that DOE will use to evaluate each application. Please note that everything contained in today's presentation is pulled directly from the Ready Fellow document, which is currently avail available on FedConnect and Grants.gov. <clears throat> also, in order to maintain fairness to all potential applicants, we will not answer live questions during today's webinar pertaining to the Ready Fellow. So, please do not um, enter any Fellow questions through the webinar portal, and instead submit questions through the FedConnect portal uh, on the FedConnect website. So the Ready Fella is a DOE action that supports White House initiatives responding to the needs of communities nationwide that are dealing with the impacts of climate change. The DOE's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability is providing opportunities to deploy smart grid technologies and tools 
to improve climate preparedness and resiliency of the electricity delivery infrastructure. The SFO is being administered by the DOE's National Energy Technology Lab. I will serve as the Merit Review Panel Chairperson for the award selection process, and Dan Tan, who's presenting later on this webinar, is the DOE program official for the READY initiative. So the purpose of the ready foe is to deploy smart grid technologies and tools to advance climate preparedness and resiliency. Deployments must result in measurable and progressive improvements in robustness and recovery of electricity delivery services within their communities. Additionally, the ready foe supports a larger DOE initiative to identify and showcase U.S., local, and tribal governments that have proven to be climate leaders by pursuing opportunities to advance the administration's policy goal of enhancing climate resilience. Another DOE initiative is, a, is the designation of local governments as climate action champions in response to a DOE solicitation that was issued last fall. So to be eligible to apply for an award under the Ready FOA, an applicant must qualify as a local government. Uh, local government definition is listed here for the purposes of this FOA, which is a town, township, city, county, city, county government, federally recognized tribal government, or other municipality, including a U.S. territory municipality, located within a county or county equivalent that experienced at least one presidentially declared major disaster declaration from and including 1984 to 2014. Local government applicants must identify the presidentially declared major disaster declaration that makes them eligible within their application and this can be found by visiting FEMA.gov slash disasters to search a sortable database of presidency declared disaster declarations. So two topic areas are offered to accomplish the objectives of the Ready Fill initiative. Topic area one is industry technologies. And topic area two is DOE National Laboratory Technologies. Uh, under both topic area, applicants are encouraged to collaborate um, with different entities. For topic area one, teaming with an electric utility is encouraged. And for topic area two, collaboration with a DOE national lab for technical assistance on using the technology or tool is encouraged but not required. If the applicant then DOE will directly fund technical assistance by that national laboratory. So under the Ready Fill, a total of four to eight awards are anticipated, with two to four awards per, per topic area. The total anticipated award, siding, award size includes 600000 to $1.2 million for topic area one, and $1.2 million to $2 million for topic area two. That includes a cost share requirement of at least 50% of the total allowable cost. Accordingly, the minimum federal uh, award amount for topic area one is $300,000, with a maximum of $600,000. And for topic area two, the minimum federal funding is $600,000 with a maximum of $1 million. The estimated project period for each award is expected to be two years or 24 months. So for the purposes of the Ready Fella, smart grid technologies and tools include smart grid distribution and customer side technologies for climate impact resilience. Transmission technologies and tools are excluded from selection under this fella. For Topic Area 1 applications, Appendix A on FedConnect and Grants.gov provides a non-inclusive list of example commercial and pre-commercial smart grid technologies and tools. The list is intentionally broad to include a wide variety of smart grid technologies and tools that will help decision makers address local climate impacts. For Topic Area 2 applications, Appendix B on FedConnect and Grants.gov provides a non-inclusive list of smart grid technologies and tools developed by national laboratories that meet the required readiness level and have a direct application for enhanced electricity delivery infrastructure resilience. Applicants under Topic Area 2 are free to propose a DOE National Lab technology or tool that is not listed in Appendix B. For either topic area, if an applicant is unsure of the eligibility of their proposed smart grid technology or tool, then a question can be submitted through the FedConnect portal. For both Topic Area 1 and 2, smart grid technologies and tools of interest must spe specifically relate to the electricity delivery infrastructure 
on the customer side of the utility's electric meter and or in the distribution system. Technologies and tools may serve one or more of the following applications. Risk assessments and management of climate change impacts, preparedness for and recovery from climate change impacts, and economic and societal impact analysis of smart grid technologies and tools for climate resilience. The objectives of the Ready Forward are selective wards that will improve electricity resiliency to climate change within the county that experienced a presidentially declared major disaster from 1984 to 2014. A local government selected for award will be expected to demonstrate significant improvements in robustness and recovery of electricity delivery infrastructure. Improvements must be measurable, tangible within 24 months of the project start date, substantial over a long period of time, accountable for resilience to environmental stressors, and be implemented within the county that experienced the presidentially declared major disaster dating back to 1984. In addition to describing how the proposed smart grid technology or tool is used, the application must describe the proposed data collected before and after deployment of the technology tool in order to measure resiliency improvements and how it improves resiliency in the long term. Applications for topic area one and two must include information on measuring resiliency while also making sure to comply with the merit view record criteria that's contained in the FOA document. I will briefly go over the, the four merit review criteria in just a few slides. If an applicant is proposing to deploy a technology or tool that is used to produce or move power for grid sensing, control, or include a cybersecurity approach that will provide a reasonable assurance of preventing systematic failures in the electric grid in the event of a cybersecurity breach. Also, applications under Topic Area 1 and 2 must include metrics demonstrating the technology or tool's capability for improvement in resiliency. Suggested metrics are listed uh, as shown in the Ready Fellow, which include IEEE reliability indices, customer minutes of interruption, number of customers impacted, cost impacts, and societal impacts. So in addition to the requirements to measuring resiliency, addressing cybersecurity, and including metrics to measure improvements in resiliency that I just discussed, there are four separate criteria that must be addressed in each applicant's ready fill out proposal. The four criteria are assigned different weights, which DOE will use to review applications and select a beneficial impact is weighted the highest at 40%. Criteria 1 guidelines shown here are cut and paste directly from the language of the ready fill out. This criteria requires the applicant to demonstrate that after the 24-month project period, the technology or tool proposed can be deployed on a commercial level or is scalable for national deployment. This section must also address the reasonableness of the estimated impacts of the project to produce measurable and tangible improvements in resiliency, robustness, and recovery of the electricity delivery infrastructure within the territory of the local government that's applying for the award. Criteria 2, technical approach, is weighted 30%. The language shown here for criteria 2 is, is exactly as it appears in the Ready Fell. This criteria allows the applicant to demonstrate the proposed design, procurement, installation, and operation of the smart grid technology or tool, which will address specific shortcomings experienced in electricity delivery infrastructure during major disaster de declaration events. Criteria 3, experience and capabilities of the project team is weighted 20%. Once again, this language here is posted exactly as it appears in the ready fill. This criteria allows each applicant to demonstrate the experience of the project team with the implementation of smart grid technologies and tools and the team's experience analyzing metrics, costs, and benefits of deploying smart grid technologies and tools. This criteria will also assess the degree of commitment by the project team typically demonstrated using letters of support from collaborating stakeholders. And it appears my, oh, there we go. And finally, criteria for management of the project is weighted 10%. Uh, these guidelines are as they appear in the ready fill 
And this criteria is for the applicant to demonstrate the DOE that adequate project management practices are in place so the entire project team is well coordinated to accomplish project milestones and spending within the 24-month project period. So in closing, uh, the ready fill a deadline is May 4, 2015, 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, applicants can visit FedConnect or Grants.gov and search for opportunity DE dash FOA dash 0001219. And in order to maintain fairness to all potential applicants, uh, I cannot answer any live questions during today's webinar. Um, the questions regarding FOA can be submitted through the FedConnect portal. When submitting questions through the FedConnect portal, please do not reveal your identity so DOE can post the questions and DOE's response. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan, very much for your presentation. We are going to move on next to Dan Tan for his presentation, and that will be up in just one second. Okay, Dan, please go ahead. Okay, I don't still don't have uh, control of my slides yet. Uh, but anyway, my name is Dan Tan. I'm with the Power Systems Engi Engineering Research and Development uh, within the Office of Electricity. Uh, DOE. Uh, I would like to first thank ASTAP for hosting this webinar. And uh, my presentation today will be on the microgrid uh, for resiliency. Okay. Um, so I wanted to go over a little bit about the defining uh, definition of a microgrid because there are many out there. Uh, since microgrid is an important part of smart grid, uh, in our definition, microgrid is a group of interconnected load and distributed energy resources. Uh, it has to be within a clearly defined uh, electrical boundary. Um, and act as a single controllable entity with respect to the grid. So basically, it has its own boundary and it has the capability to control itself uh, so that it can connect and disconnect from the grid to uh, operate in both grid connected or island mode. Uh, on the right side, you see the modular um, characteristics of microgrid. It could be uh, from one single customer uh, in a building. Uh, it has, um, if that building meets our criteria, or it could be a partial feeder uh, microgrid uh, all the way up to a whole substation. And on the top, you will see different sizes of microgrid from residential, commercial, small commercial, or commercial buildings. Uh, so I wanted to list a, a few benefits here. Um, uh, microgrid um, has the capability to expand the um, enable improving the grid modernization uh, through uh, improving the capability to integrate multiple uh, smart grid technologies as well as uh, enhancing the integration of distributed and renewable energy sources. Uh, things like combined heat and power and uh, small wind or photovoltaics are fitted under this uh, microgrid. Um, and it meets the end user needs by ensuring energy supply for the critical loads, uh, controlling power quality and reliability at the load level. And also, it helps support the micro, uh, at the grid in general by providing uh, reliability to that sensitive load, and it could support the uh, the grid in general uh, by providing ancillary service uh, and other uh, services. 
Um, on the right side, uh, now that we have proven uh, more different microgrid in the United States, there are still challenges that we are facing. So there are, uh, our program is still addressing the research development needs um, for DOE um, in general. And these are the things that we listed uh, in terms of technical challenges. Uh, I wanted to give you an example, uh, a few examples of microgrid. The first one will be uh, focusing on improving energy efficiencies. Uh, in this example, Fort Collins um, has successfully demonstrated microgrid project uh, funded by ARP office uh, in a program called Renewable Distributed System Integration. And uh, in this program, the city and the city-owned uh, Fort Collins utility has uh, established a zero energy district by developing and demonstrating an integrated system of ne nearly 30 distributed generation renewable energy um, resources across five different uh, customer locations. And uh, for an aggregated capacity of 4 megawatts and, uh, and a 20 to 30 percent peak load reductions. So in this uh, RDSI solicitation established in 2009, the goal of that project is to demonstrate that microgrid can be utilized to reduce the peak load uh, by at least 15 percent. So uh, the Fort Z is already demonstrating that it can uh, reduce the peak load by more than 20 percent. Um, the resources that are being here in Fort Z is uh, photovoltaic, uh, micro turbines, uh, dual fuel combined heat and power systems, uh, reciprocating engines, backup generators, wind, uh, plug-in electric vehicles, and, and fuel cells. On this slide here, I wanted to give you an example of microgrids for resilience. Uh, the first one is an example of um, a project in New York, uh, in Manhattan, where it's demonstra demonstrating um, that a technology that developed uh, with our program uh, that was uh, used to support uh, hundreds of uh, people in this uh, co-op uh, in New York, uh, and and uh, it um, uh, through the uh, with sending the, uh, the impact by Superstorm Sandy. Uh, the second one on the right is. Uh, research that we've done with the Washington State University, uh, whereas uh, the microgrid has demonstrated that it has the capability uh, to send power uh, to a hospital and, and office buildings about uh, three miles away uh, outside of the microgrid boundary. Um, so, uh, you know, this is part of our work uh, is to support um, partnerships with the states. In, in this example, um, we are partnering with uh, New Jersey in two projects. Uh, after Superstorm Sandy, um, we deploy microgrids uh, for rebuilding electric infrastructure by providing technical assistance and advanced uh, R&D products. Um, DOE has partnered with New Jersey Transit to develop a microgrid to enhance grid rail resiliency to serve over 900,000 riders a day. And the Federal Transit Administration provided additional funds uh, to build the microgrid based on DOE uh, developed design. Um, and as a result, New Jersey Transit received nearly uh, $410 million in federal grants from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, to build the microgrid based on DOE de developed design. The second project is uh, with the Hoboken uh, city. Um, 
the project directly linked uh, to uh, the energy surety uh, design with Sandia National Labs um, to support critical power needs. And it does this by integrating distributed energy resources, including backup generators, uh, local PV systems, small wind turbines, um, electrical energy storage, etc., into a local electrical distribution service area or microgrid. And this uh, decentralized design approach allows the uh, distributed energy resources to be managed intelligently, uh, efficiently, and reliably. And that uh, concludes my um, presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay, Samantha? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I apologize for the glitch earlier. We uh, had a little uh, problem with our system, but we seem to be back now. So um, thank you very much to Ryan Watson and Dan Tan. And we're now going to move to the third speaker, uh, Dr. Emery Zhuk. And Samantha, if you could get Dr. Zhuk's slides up, and I will pass this over to him. Go ahead, please. Are the slides up? They are. Okay, well, hello. I'm Imre Zhuk with the Department of Electricity, and I'm the Energy Storage Manager. And I will talk to you about energy storage. Uh, this is kind of ironical because I'm sitting here in the middle of a large area outage. And nobody seems to know how it came about. And there certainly isn't any real backup except for the emergency lights. Anyway, energy storage. Uh, can be applied to a resilient grid, to renewable generation, and for an efficient microgrid. Basically, next slide, we are going to talk about stationary energy storage. So that excludes vehicles, and it also excludes uh, individual homeowners uh, energy storage devices uh, tied to, say, for example, a uh, photovoltaic device. Uh, we are talking about the grid and particularly the distribution grid. So the ba basic uh, principle is that storage links variable load with variable generation. And storage acts as a buffer. One of, we, have been, we have been doing this for the last decade or so, uh, advancing storage from a technology that originally nobody knew about until now it is one of the hottest topics in the electricity business. Uh, one of the big contributors to that was the ARA stimulus funding for storage demonstration projects. We were lucky to uh, get leveraged funding of $185 million. Uh, not nearly as much as some other programs got, but uh, uh, nonetheless quite substantial. What I'm really proud about is that we were able to leverage $585 million from industry. So what do we want to do? storage projects. First of all, we wanted to show technical feasibility. The thing has got to work. Second, we want to gather cost data so that we have a much better grip on what the, what the costs are, what the benefits are, and uh, how to improve uh, the, the costs. We also want to stimulate regulatory changes because the regulatory system is not set up at all for energy storage. It talks to distribution generation uh, but, and tra transmission, but not to energy storage. 
And finally, we want to generate follow-on projects. So let me show you some of these energy storage projects as we have uh, built them. Energy storage systems fall into two broad categories. They are power systems and they are energy systems. Power systems apply to such uh, areas as frequency regulation or renewable smoothing. Frequency regulation uh, is the small fluctuations on the net because the load and the uh, generation are supposed to be balanced. Uh, they are never really balanced. Uh, so we need to go in there and provide extra energy or take out energy uh, in order to balance generation and load. A particular example that uh, we built uh, together with Duke Energy uh, was a 36 megawatt 40 minute battery plant uh, for smoothing and frequency regulation. Uh, it is tied up with 153 megawatts of wind at a place called Note. Is there, but there are batteries now. The next thing I want to take up is energy systems for peak shaving, load shifting, or ramping. These are systems that do not just take uh, 15 minutes. Uh, they can stay on for hours at a time. The first example that I have here is uh, with Public Service New Mexico. Uh, you can see the uh, photovoltaic field to which it is connected and the white things at the end of the batteries. Now, what do we want to use that for? Uh, the graph from nearby Arizona uh, tells the story. First of all, if you look at the curve that gives the amount of solar power, uh, you can see that there are continual breaks. That's when clouds uh, move across or contrails. Uh, you know, there are outages. It's not a smooth source. The uh, top shows you the load curve. The load curve doesn't coincide with the peak of the uh, uh, insulation curve. So we want to do two things. First of all, we want to smooth out the uh, short-term uh, uh, storage. And we want to move, uh, move the entire peak over to where the main requirements are. So that's load shifting. So this system does both. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we have a project with Southern California Edison. Uh, this is a system with eight megawatts out, eight megawatt hours, and four hour and a four hour uh, runtime. It's specifically for wind integration at Tehachapi, Tehachapi in California. Tehachapi, of course, is one of the biggest wind developments in the country. And this project was commissioned uh, in September of last year. Now we get to something. Uh, oops. To another topic. And that is specifically energy systems for resiliency and emergency preparedness. And uh, this is part of our DOE state initiative on energy storage. Next slide. If you look at the graph at the upper right-hand corner, it shows you the annual average temperature for Washington, D.C. As you can see, the temperature is clearly going up. There is a trend there. If you look at the lower graph, 
you will see the number of natural disasters exceeding the same trend uh, is visible there. And what the trends indicate is that the situation will get worse, not better. And of course, what an emergency looks like is there on the picture uh, during the Sandy emergency. Uh, it was not pretty. But what we have learned there is that every $1 on spent on protection measurements can prevent $4 in repair after the storm. So why don't we solve the situation by putting a lot of diesels around? Well, it's not that easy, because what we have found is that some 50% of diesel generators failed to start during the Sandy emergency. What you can do is you can build microgrids that combine storage with renewables. A microgrid alone uh, isn't going to do very much. But a microgrid with storage and renewables is going to provide essential services over an extended time period. Now, the same system uh, during non-emergency periods uh, the storage can provide demand management for the user and compensated services to the grid. And the uh, renewables that you have in the system can provide green power to the grid. Where can you do this? Well, you can do it any place. Islands, apartment buildings, campuses, schools, shopping centers, and so on and so on. Wherever you want to assure greater resiliency and greater uh, continuity in service. And on the next slide, we have such a sample, ready-made. Uh, we have a project with Vermont Public Service uh, and Green Mountain Power. And it's in Rutland, Vermont. And it's a 4 megawatt, 3.4 megawatt hour storage system integrated with two megawatts of PV. Uh, the groundbreaking was done in August of 2014, and the expected completion is uh, later this month. Uh, it has a number of features. It's situated in, on a brown field area, for example. Uh, it uh, links the storage and uh, the PVs uh, with a DC bus. Uh, and uh, above all, it has uh, complete buy-in from state and local government. What it will do is, of course, it will do ancillary, ancillary grid services and peak shaving during high load periods. And the system can be islanded to provide emergency power for a resilient microgrid serving a high school emergency center. Now, this town knows the importance of having uh, emergency backup. Uh, a few years ago, uh, after a particularly severe storm, they spent uh, two weeks uh, out of power uh, and out of communication. Uh, the, the bridges had been swept away. Uh, there was no transportation, uh, no food delivery. Nobody could leave. Uh, the community was entirely on their own uh, without electricity. So resiliency is very important during disasters. Another example is in uh, the state of Washington. And here, the Washington State Clean Energy Fund has provided $15 million for a number of energy storage projects uh, in which we are also involved. Notably, uh, two of these projects that were selected involve a uh, vanadium uh, flow battery, which was developed uh, at Pacific Northwest Laboratory for my program. And it has twice the energy density of other flow batteries uh, of the type. Uh, the two projects, uh, one is with Avista, a one megawatt installation, and the other one, eight uh, megawatt hour 
uh, installation. In both of the, these systems, uh, Pacific Northwest Laboratory will be involved to uh, provide use case assessment and performance analysis. Uh, and the commissioning was last week, on April 2nd. I was there. Everything works and everything is ready uh, to provide resilience to the local grid. Now the next example shows how these uh, cost and benefit uh, evaluations are carried out. It's uh, a project uh, be uh, done together with BPA, uh, Department of Energy, and Puget Sound. And what happened there is on Bainbridge Island, they needed to put in a, a new substation. But the uh, inhabitants decided that rather than have a substation, they wanted to have energy storage. So we identified four potential sites. And then PNL did a careful analysis of all these sites and determined which of them would have the higher cost benefit, uh, the lowest cost benefit ratio. And the way this works is you look at the installed energy storage. And you look at the costs. And you have things like site preparation the device itself, operating and maintenance, and, and the uh, evaluation of uh, the substation which it uh, would be replacing. And then the benefits uh, consist of distribution upgrade, deferral, uh, outage prevention, uh, balancing services, and capacity value. It's important to remember that in any storage application, you need to use multiple benefit streams. You can't do it uh, on one benefit stream alone. And interesting enough, the light just went on. So presumably our outage has ended. And when you put together the storage costs and the storage benefits, uh, you find is less than the substation cost. Uh, PNL has a public, uh, publicly available system, but uh, they're also uh, willing to help people uh, doing these uh, cost evaluations. Finally, I'm going to talk about industry tools. Uh, the page shows you things, uh, uh, assistance that PNL and SNL respectively are willing to provide. Uh, SNL is extremely experienced in hardware and uh, can help with commissioning and uh, writing RFPs and what have you. PNL uh, is uh, experienced in the assessment of cost benefits and determining the correct scale and location for storage. Next. Um, another tool that is available is the Sandia National Laboratory Energy Storage System Analysis Laboratory. Uh, here you can have your energy storage units tested out to make sure that they work uh, when you put them on site. And we can handle systems up to one megawatt there. And finally, I want to mention the DOE's International Energy Storage Database, which now has over 1,200 uh, projects from 58 countries uh, in it. And you can, uh, it's searchable. You can look at your area. You can look at specific technologies. And uh, you can get a good idea of what storage projects are out there. So over 1,200 projects uh, in existence around the world. So. As I hope I have shown to you, uh, energy storage is coming of age. We have new cost-effective technologies. Uh, we are opening new benefit streams. We have major solicitations or mandates going on in California, in Hawaii, and in Ontario. Uh, we are involving individual states 
such as Vermont, Washington, and the next one will be Oregon, and perhaps Massachusetts. And energy storage also attracts considerable uh, attention worldwide, uh, in particular countries like China, Japan, Korea, Australia, and also uh, Europe. So, uh, energy storage is coming of age, and, re and remember, a smart grid with storage is a smarter grid. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emery, and thank you as well to Dan Tan and Ryan Watson. Uh, we do have a few questions. Uh, I think we may have scared people off. We have, a hundred and, we have over 125 people in the webinar and about four questions. So uh, I will, I will, that is not specifically a procurement question about the FOA, but a more general question about technology um, or something else that was presented. Um, please feel free to type it in and we'll get to it as we as best we can. So uh, let's see, I think this one might be a question for Imri. The question is, do you foresee bulk storage systems like compressed air storage coming into the picture? Uh, bulk storage like compressed air is certainly on the horizon. Uh, as you might know, uh, you can take uh, energy from, uh, let's say, off-peak wind uh, and uh, use it to uh, compress large amounts of air in the ground or in, or in pipes or whatever it is. And then you can use this energy during peak periods uh, to supplement your, uh, uh, your generation. in existence in the world, uh, one of them in Germany, one of them in Alabama. Uh, I had decided that it's time to look at the issue again, uh, and I put energy storage uh, by compressed air energy storage, so-called CASE, uh, into my uh, solicitation for uh, the ARA project. Uh, we had two projects. One of them didn't work out because the salt ca caverns in which they were going to store the air. Uh, the other one is by uh, uh, is in California, and uh, that one is going on. Uh, and uh, I expect it to be uh, operational in a few years. Now, meanwhile, this has also stimulated at least four or five projects that I know of. Uh, some of them are smaller, some of them are larger, and I expect to see uh, various uh, uh, companies and utilities uh, go into the uh, uh, compressed air energy storage business. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anybody else want to jump in on that question before I move to the next one? Okay. Uh, I, um, uh, regarding stored hydrogen from water hydrolysis, is that regarded as a viable approach? Well, some people consider it viable. In particular, there's a lot of interest in it in Europe. Uh, the trouble is, unlike other storage technologies, uh, it has a much further way to go. Uh, the thing is that you lose a lot of energy when you hydrolyze water. Uh, you then have to store it, and store it, and then you have to use it in the fuel cell. Or alternatively, you can put hydrogen directly into the gas pipelines. But the system is as yet uh, much too expensive and the energy uh, goes against you, so you really have to have basically free energy. Okay, very good. 
Uh, another question, I, I, on some of these I'm going to have to ask whether we can address them. Um, this question is, can municipalities collaborate on applications for READY? Is that one that we can address? Can there be collaborations between municipalities? This is Ryan. I'm going to ask that um, that question be submitted through the FedConnect portal so we can make sure the response is addressed to the public at large. Okay. So uh, on the screen uh, you will see a, uh, a link and um, that will take you to the DOE uh, website and I think you can access that FedConnect portal at that site. Okay, and here is uh, another that I suspect we're going to have to <laughs> defer as well. It's are smart inverters something that this solicitation is looking for? And what about different types of software? Dan, how about you? Uh, you t uh, this is, is uh, not just uh, technology that Dan, Dan I recommend that, we, uh, that, that question be submitted through the FedConnect portal since it's directed towards the FA process. Okay, we will try to steer clear of anything directly regarding this FOA. Uh, so you have, to, a, uh, you have to put your questions uh, directly towards the technology. Okay, there you go. So here's but a For example, it's entirely uh, reasonable. Uh, all energy and other equipment of that type, and that would be included. Okay. Here's a, here's a technology-oriented question. How does vanadium compare to lithium-ion battery storage technology in terms of performance, expected lifetime, and operations and maintenance? Okay, I'll take that one again. Um, lithium-ion is essentially a power battery. Uh, and its main advantage is small footprint. Uh, that's why you find lithium-ion batteries in your personal uh, electronics devices. Uh, you can obviously make large uh, installations. I showed you one that has 8 megawatts and 4 hours of runtime, but it's not the ideal way of doing it with lithium. If you really want to have uh, a four-hour span, uh, which allows you to uh, peak shave and load shift, uh, flow batteries are much more suitable. Uh, Cost-wise, uh, I would say flow batteries, uh, particularly uh, are decreasing their cost very considerably. And I think they are competitive with lithium-ion. Uh, lithium-ion generally is uh, intended to be used for about 10 years. Flow, battery, flow batteries uh, may have a lifetime of 20 years or so. Uh, however, since none of these devices have actually been a in an energy storage capacity, and that includes lithium, uh, all of these things are assumptions to some degree. Okay, thank you very much. Um, here's another uh, sort of general question. Um, the questioner says, generally resilience is linked with smart grid installations at, di at the distribution side, but do you think long dispatch transmission lines across interconnections help resistance? And then uh, the example given here is improved, for example, I think that's out of our uh, out of our uh, scope uh, simply because uh, 
aspect of cost. I think we are going to be talking about substation uh, and, and below. Okay. Uh, here's somebody who wants to know, would stationary fuel cells and batteries work in unison to back up renewables? Um, I see the theory about batteries backing up solar PV, but it makes more sense to this uh, person to cover uh, the 24-7 all-weather baseload aspect of the microgrid and then talk about the renewables role. So I guess the question is combining fuel cells and batteries to back up renewables. Well, that is certainly possible. However, uh, fuel cells are in much the same boat as uh, diesel uh, generators. Uh, during an emergency, uh, they may not run because you're not assured of your, uh, of your fuel situation. OK. Very good. Um, of course, the fuel cells are pretty expensive. Yeah. OK. Uh, here's a question. What are the recycling or disposal implications of storage systems? Ah, that's a very good question. First of all, what is generally not known is that lead-acid batteries are among the most exquisitely recycled devices, industrial devices that we have. Uh, lead acid batteries are recycled about 98%. Uh, in fact, if it weren't from the lead from uh, discarded lead acid batteries, we wouldn't be able to put uh, build new lead acid batteries. Now, with lithium ion, uh, that uh, is a sore point, uh, particularly as we are going to have more lithium ion batteries uh, from vehicles. There is really no way to meaningfully recycle the lithium ion batteries. So basically, you have to figure on the disposal cost of potentially thousands, if not millions, of lithium ion cells uh, that uh, enter the waste stream. Uh, however, battery, lithium ion batteries from vehicles uh, could very well be reused, because a lithium ion battery uh, in an electric vehicle uh, generally would be discarded after it has lost about 20% of the capacity. So you have a battery there that is still quite good, and you could put them together into a stationary, a big stationary battery. Uh, we have a program at Oak Ridge National Laboratory which does just that, and a number of other laboratories are uh, in, uh, interested in that uh, project too. Uh, but whether that will be entirely cost effective, we don't know it yet. Now, when it comes to vanadium batteries, for example, these again are recyclable. Uh, if you, for some reason, wanted to uh, dismantle your vanadium battery, uh, you can sell the electrolyte uh, back to the company or another company uh, because the electrolyte has not really changed uh, during your period and uh, we'll use the rest of scrap metal. I hope OK. I, I think so. Here's one, again, I, I need to, f to ask whether we can address this. The question is, did I hear that the technology must specifically relate to customer side of the meter? It's a question clarifying something that I think was said can we state whether or not that was actually stated earlier? No, not at all. Yeah. That question because the meter. municipality is interested in uh, improving uh, the uh, the system on a on a municipal basis. Now it may end up to be customer side. For example, the uh, the emergency center 
uh, is customer side. But when it is not islanded, it interacts with the rest of the grid. OK. Uh, here's a question about uh, a recently unveiled utility-funded and operated microgrid by Encore, which is the utility, um, large utility in Texas. Uh, it's, the questioner says, uh, that particular microgrid seems to incorporate a wide range of advanced software and hardware capabilities. Do you see microgrid development as a simple low voltage solution for backup or a medium voltage solution with higher capabilities? I would like to see higher capability. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. Uh, I think uh, on our, my slide it has a different um, uh, type of uh, and sizes of microgrid. Our particular interest, uh, because we are working on the grid side of the meter, uh, would like to look at the uh, system that, you know, medium voltage, uh, higher than, you know, low voltage for internet or things like that within the home or buildings. Okay. Flow batteries. Can can they simultaneously perform energy and power functions and benefits, uh, for example, site cost savings and also ancillary regulation for the local utility at the same time? Yeah, there is at least half a dozen functions that a flow battery can uh, perform. Uh, flow batteries can respond uh, as well as, uh, uh, say, lithium-ion batteries to uh, fluctuations, to, to, uh, short-term fluctuations, and uh, they can serve as backup and, and so on. Uh, the interesting thing, of course, is uh, you need to develop a careful algorithm which will allow these functions to be uh, active side. OK. Uh, here's a question uh, specifically for Emery. Can you discuss the deal structure for the, the Puget Sound project? Mm, what do you mean by the deal structure? Uh, I, I'm just reading the question as it was typed in. I don't know what the, the person means by that. Uh, okay. I probably... you know, I do not know about the financing. Uh, BPA, most of the support is from BPA. Uh, I assume Puget Sound also uh, has uh, some financial contribution there. Uh, the interaction with the Department of Energy is that through a memorandum of understanding with Washington State, we provide the uh, services of P&L to do the cost-benefit siting evaluation. And of course, the, uh, the technology itself, uh, the, uh, the Biprimus, uh, was developed under an ARA grant. I hope that gives you as much as I can give. Okay, great. Uh, somebody wants to know uh, how would one go about partnering with a partnering with a national lab? That'd be a great question to refer through the SiteConnect portal so we can publish guidance on how to do so. Okay. Uh, here's another question. What is the status of systems involving the storage of heat in molten substances? Uh, storing heat in molten substances uh, is uh, of this particular uh, FOA uh, simply because uh, our office is not concerned with it. There are two ways uh, in which molten substances can work in this case. Uh, one of them is uh, in connection with uh, solar thermal 
were essentially using the heat of the sun uh, to warm up, uh, to melt uh, salts. And uh, these uh, molten salts are then available when the sun has already set. Uh, and uh, you can uh, run water through it and, and run a boiler and produce electricity. Uh, that's one which one hears about every now and then is the possibility of heat up the salt, uh, have it go through its phase change, and then uh, use it as a generator uh, at night or whenever. Uh, I am not aware of any particularly successful, successfully applied systems of that type. Okay. This is actually a kind of a follow-up question. Uh, the person who asked the previous question about flow batteries uh, wants to confirm that, are you saying that they can simultaneously operate as power and energy uh, at the same time, or are you saying that they can sequentially operate as power and energy? Well, in general, uh, you want to look at what function you can most uh, you, you can derive most uh, uh, revenue from, and so that will generally mean that you're going to go uh, that you're going to go sequentially. Uh, however, some of the functions can be done simultaneously. So, for example, you could reserve a certain amount uh, of your uh, of your storage and have it respond to uh, small fluctuations and do the rest with, uh, uh, with, with load shifting. See, the thing is, if, if you have, uh, for example, uh, stored uh, 4 megawatts, uh, uh, 4 megawatt hours of uh, energy, uh, you have stored them, you're waiting until peak period so you can uh, supply uh, energy during the peak period. In between while you're uh, waiting, there's no reason why you can't go up and down and up and down uh, on the grid uh, with uh, small fluctuations. OK, good. Uh, Somebody, a couple of people have been at, uh, sent in questions about um, some of the remarks about <clears throat> diesel generators. Uh, what were the causes of the diesel generators not starting? In other words, placement, uh, not being regularly uh, checked or regularly tested. I think I know the an uh, at least one answer to this, but I'll throw yeah. this out uh, to, to take it. Perhaps the main reason is uh, not checking them regularly. Uh, if you happen to own a lawnmower and you uh, store your this is a this is a gasoline lawnmower and you store it over the winter in your garage and you had your tank moderately full, you may have found that it's very difficult to uh, start up your diesel uh, in the spring. Uh, in fact, you might have to drain your tank and put in new gasoline because uh, diesel is not uh, is not stable. Uh, the volatile substances evaporate, and you're left with gummy residues, uh, which mean that your diesel won't start. Uh, so you would have to use it regularly. You would have to discard. Your, uh, your tanks uh, after a year or so, I don't know what the exact period is, uh, and uh, replace both your the fuel inside your diesel and the fuel uh, that you have stored in tanks uh, with, with fresh fuel. So not a terribly good solution. Thank you. I, I, I also um, I wanted to just supplement that because we, we've done some looking into this in the case of uh, Hurricane Sandy. Um, the, there were some diesels that were badly located in, in basements, for example, and got uh, uh, drowned in the flooding. Yeah, there that were some, would not be as well. 
Yeah, there were some that were actually on roofs or, or in upper areas of buildings, but unfortunately the, the, the fuel pumps uh, were located down near the ground because that's where the tanks were, so the fuel pumps were then drowned and they uh, failed to deliver fuel to the generators. In some cases they ran, but then ran out of fuel stored on site and due to the nature of a natural disaster, it's often very difficult to get deliveries of replacement fuel, especially as it's in high demand for uh, first responder vehicles and so forth. So um, there were cases where first responders were actually carrying diesel fuel in buckets up stairwells to keep generators running. Um, so that's just a, a, a little expansion on that. and. Um, I think the other point regarding the, the diesels is that they, they, they only are used in the case of, a, of an outage. So where it, the, there's a huge difference between a, a diesel that sits idle 99% of the time and a microgrid or other type of resilient power system that runs uh, year-round and provides benefits year-round. Okay, um, this is a question about ISO New England. The, Questioner says that the grid operator in New England has a frequency regulation market, but a minimum of one megawatt to participate. That means I, I take it that there's that your uh, distributed energy resource must be at least a megawatt of capacity in order to participate in that frequency regulation market in New England. Can you provide any recommendations for a state energy office to argue for a lower minimum? Um, I, I would like that person to contact me, but I, does anybody, any of the presenters want to take a crack at that? Yeah, I can. Uh, creating a regulatory structure that, uh, that accommodates storage in an appropriate way uh, is an important goal. But I would hesitate to make direct recommendations because uh, these uh, regulations have to develop uh, not only on the basis of what is actually out there, but also uh, responding to the needs of a variety of users, which include utilities, uh, renewable energy providers, uh, storage providers, if you wish, uh, and of course the 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 the, uh, the well-being of the public in general. So uh, I wouldn't want to touch that one directly, but it's certainly an issue that should be discussed uh, by experts and others. Okay, very good. Here's a question for Dan Tan. Uh, the person said, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, the, the person says we need to show our PUC an example of third party funding used for, distri for distribution upgrades that are not directly rate based. Uh, any examples of that? Third party funding used for distribution upgrades that are not directly rate based. Uh, so far, I haven't seen one um, that is related with the rate base. Um, there may be a Recovery Act projects. Uh, uh, through the Recovery Act project, the DOE provided funding for pilots that are not related with rate base. Um, but I need to, we need to review um, that. Uh, in compare to whether it's uh, it's a, you know related solely on uh, renewable integrations or, or other things that um, that you're asking for. Well, I think the questioner doesn't really mean the federal government when he says third-party financing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're you're probably right. I. Uh, not what's uh, intended. Anybody else want to? I would, talk I would to put that? the question in, into the portal and see whether somebody answers it. Okay. 
Okay, good. Uh, here's a question. Uh, it says, uh, many ARRA projects have, have done very well, but would the ARRA projects that have not succeeded, uh, would that money be reallocated to other storage projects? Or can one suggest alternate storage technology for projects that have been canceled? To my infinite regret, the answer is no. Because I have a number of uh, projects that were not completed uh, and have considerable amounts of money in it, but that money re reverts to uh, the government. by And this is by congressional uh, mandate. OK. Uh, another question about um, about uh, vanadium batteries. Is there estimated operation and maintenance activities and uh, costs for vanadium batteries? Uh, I do not have them at my fingertips, but I would expect them to be fairly low because uh, the way a vanadium battery goes, it does not have to be scraped down or, uh, or uh, you know, other activities that happen in some batteries. Uh, it should be fairly maintenance free, but we will know when we have run them for a while. We have run them in the lab, of course, uh, for considerable periods. And uh, it appears that maintenance costs are going to be fairly low. So at any rate, it isn't that you have to change out all the batteries after three years. OK, great. Uh, this is uh, another question for Emory. Any market for storage in general, both uh, distributed and grid scale? You mean, what is the market for it? I think the questioner is asking, where is the best market uh, geographically? You mean, if you're a producer of energy storage devices? I, I, I don't know. I can't. I'm, I'm, I can only read the question as it was presented. Yeah. OK. Well, let, let me try and, and, and uh, of course, the, the, the market is worldwide. Uh, China has a large market. Uh, there is an, there's a market opening up in Africa for small devices, particularly on village scale uh, microgrids. Uh, countries like Japan certainly uh, have a need for storage because uh, they need the flexibility, and their hydropower has about reached uh, the limit. So storage markets are opening up everywhere. There are estimates by uh, companies that do this kind of thing professionally that talks about giga markets. You know, I would I would expect uh, greater and greater penetration in, in in a lot of other places. Of course, California alone has mandated 1.3 gigawatts of storage. Alone is is a sizable market. And if you want the market in the rest of the United States, you multiply that by eight as a rule of thumb. OK, good. Uh, here's a question again about uh, diesels. How was the 50% failure rate of diesel generators uh, in Hurricane Sandy determined? I think it com comes from surveys. Uh, I cannot give you the exact quote, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that are well known. OK. Well, I, I think we've pretty much come to the end of our time, and I appreciate uh, all the uh, questions. I apologize again that uh, we couldn't get to all of them. A, a large number of them I didn't ask because they were directly addressing uh, the FOA 
and those questioners should uh, again submit those questions through FedConnect Fed and perhaps uh, Mr. Watson could could um, instruct them how to do that. Yes, thanks Todd and um, I do want to follow up. There was a question a while back about customer side technologies. I just want to uh, refer that uh, participant to slide 8 in my presentation where I stated that for the purposes of the Ready FOA, smart grid technologies and tools include smart grid distribution in customer side technologies and tools. Uh, only transmission technologies and tools are excluded from selection under the FOA and all that language is contained within the FOA document. Um, but yes, a potential applicant can register in FedConnect and submit questions through the FedConnect portal and we just ask that the questions be generalized so you do not um, indicate who you are. That way we can just publish your question along with DOE's response for all potential applicants to see. Okay. I also want to mention that we have uh, coming up, and we don't have a, a specific date yet, but it will be very, it will be fairly soon, uh, a, a webinar in which we will take a look at some of the uh, National Laboratory tools that have been developed that, um, you know, may, may be appropriate for use um, for people applying under this FOA. So, I mean, those tools are listed in the FOA, um, there's an appendix and, and it lists a number of tools developed in various national labs and there are others that are not listed that, that may also be of interest. So we're going to be looking at some of those. Again, uh, we don't have a, a specific date, but it will be fairly soon as this FOA, I believe, closes in early May. Uh, Samantha, do we have any other upcoming events that you want to mention before we close this out? Yes, we do have several. Um, the best place to find info on those would be on our website, cisa.org backslash webinars. They're all listed there. Okay, thank you. I want to thank uh, our speakers, Dan Tan, Ryan Watson, and Emery Zhuk. And I apologize that we could not get Carol Hawk. Uh, she was scheduled to be here, but due to the uh, loss of electricity at DOE today, um, she was not able to get onto the webinar. Thanks, everybody, for your participation, and we will see you next time.